Hi, everyone. I'm here today to talk about a book that I've been looking forward to reading for a while now, and I finally had the chance and a good mindset to listen to the audiobook narrated by the author herself. This book is the memoir Beautiful Country by Chan Julie Wang, and, and I'll refer to her throughout the rest of the review simply as Chan, since that's mostly how she thought of herself in the story. The, the, the story of where the name Julie comes from does uh, also make some appearances here and there. I think the first I heard about this book was from a highly positive review by Municorn uh, from the channel The Bookish Land, um, and I definitely encourage you to go and check out her video on it. Um, as a Chinese American herself, she also had some especially unique perspectives on this one, and I'm happy to report that my review will also be highly positive because this was one of the best things I read in 2022, uh, capping off the year on a high note. I'm not always much of a memoir person, although I have read quite a few of them recently. I do sometimes really enjoy them once I read them, but they're not something I really gravitate towards, and I don't always necessarily get quite so immersed in them as I did with this one. The author, Chan Julie Wang, is a Chinese American who came to the United States with her parents when she was seven as an undocumented immigrant. And this book is the story of her childhood, but more than an exhaustive list of events in her life at the time, it's a recounting of the events, sometimes large, but other times actually pretty small in the grand scheme of things, that were formative experiences for her in ways both positive and challenging. The story is emotionally captivating and you will feel a lot of love for this young girl as you read about her experiences growing up. Some humorous, some tragic, others simply confusing. Beautiful Country, as I understand now, is the Chinese name for the United States as translated directly from the Chinese characters. Some people have commented that this is a little goofy because although a literal translation, it's not necessarily the way that most Chinese speaking people think about that word. I don't speak Chinese, so I'll admit I don't fully understand the nuances. But from what I understand, I actually think this point really underscores uh, a key strength of the book, and because of that, this is such an appropriate title. Because to the adults in Jen's life, Beautiful Country might simply be a literal but mostly irrelevant moniker that represents something different than its literal meaning. But to Chan herself as a young girl, these words shaped exactly how she thought of the country, how it was supposed to be, and in what ways it both succeeded and failed at living up to this promise once she arrived here. I really like this style of narration because although it included some sense of reflection from the writer's current vantage point, and although the language of the narrative is certainly sometimes spruced up with the writer's adult level of vocabulary, she's careful not to let any of this get in the way of the child speaking and reflecting within her narrative. I was fully immersed the entire time I was reading in the child's experiences and perspectives in a way that carried much more weight and authenticity than, for example, when adults tell you in a more removed way about how hard it was for immigrant children growing up in the United States or the specific challenges they face, in which I believe them, but I never know to what extent they're projecting their current experiences and almost an academic sort of knowledge of the situation onto others, even sometimes onto past versions of themselves. I didn't get that sense in this narration at all. And in that way, I think I learned a lot more from this book in an experiential sense than I would have in a book where the author was specifically trying to convey certain points. Because here the narrative is framed as what was important to Chen at the time, rather than some selective presentation of events to fit a narrative far removed from that initial activity. In fact, I believe the author commented in an interview that she took a diary as a child and she actually relied heavily on this diary while writing this book, and that really shows here. It also means that certain observations of Chen's feel ten times as powerful as they are when abstracted into some sort of general abstract concept. For example, seeing this young girl infer certain truths about the place of white people or Chinese people people in American society feels authentic, never forced into this narrative, and it put a real human story behind some concepts or experiences of race that adults will often claim exist and do exist, but they're just harder to fathom even though they are credible. And in particular, it conveys the way these experiences affect children as they begin to process their racial identities. For example, we're always told these days that representation of diversity in the media is important, but this really takes shape in a new way in the narrative when Chan talks about watching the PBS kids show The Puzzle Place and seeing on it a Chinese girl who she understood to represent herself. And this was an experience that stuck with her years later. I do remember that a show called The Puzzle Place existed, but I think it was just a little bit before my time, uh, so I only have a vague recollection. Although later in this book, she does briefly mention The Magic School Bus 2, which was probably my childhood favorite. In fact, I'll give it away because it's, it's pretty powerful. This was one of the inspirations for her Americanized name that she chose, because Julie Wu was the name of this character. But of course, it's hard for me to have experienced that firsthand because, I mean, I loved watching The Magic School Bus. It was my favorite show. 
But only in retrospect do I realize that this show had a diverse cast of characters, and I can recall uh, in hindsight what races the different characters must have been. At the time, though, it just went totally past me, and I didn't notice, because I guess, like a lot of white people, I just wasn't ever forced to notice this when growing up in America in the same way as children of other racial minorities are. I'm digressing from the narrative here, though. If you want a more in-depth look into this topic, and yeah, kind of in more academic discussion, I admit, I think another book I read last year, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, is a pretty decent place to start, because, um, or or particularly the first few chapters of that book, because they talk about the development and childhood of one's racial identity. Anyway, though, I can talk about that book in another video. Maybe, Maybe I will sometime. That's not the only dimension of Chen's identity that this book shows, though. To name a few of them, it explores what it was like growing up Chinese, but also poor and undocumented in New York City. The Chinese element of Chen's identity is always present, but in a way that feels very true to a child. Not fully aware yet of what this means, and as I alluded to already, struggling to begin to understand the implicit rules and what this means about how others in the United States perceive her. As the story progresses, she goes from being more clueless about all this and frequently shocked or confused as a result, to a point of actively shaping her own behavior in accordance with expectations. For example, in one chapter, she talks about how her fifth grade teacher found it hard to believe that she could be writing as strong of essays as she did, which within the context of other of Chen's school experiences, she assumes is partly because as a foreigner, it was assumed that she could not have such a strong grasp of the English language. Chen understands what's expected of her here, and from then on, just to make things easier, she makes sure to inject some spelling and grammar mistakes into every essay before she submits it. This real-life account actually brought to mind for me one fictional character, which was the first time I really saw this sort of experience portrayed in fiction, which is the character of Li, a, a Chinese man in John Steinbeck's East of Eden. While written by a white author in the 1950s, Lee seems to illustrate some awareness of an Asian American's experience living in California. Lee speaks in a pidgin English dialect, uh, meaning sort of the stereotypical, usually exaggerated and, and often kind of offensive way when portrayed by outsiders, in which Chinese Americans are often presented speaking in popular media. But he's immensely capable at what he does, effectively managing the entire household and providing sage advice throughout the story. So at one point, someone actually asks him, why is it that he speaks this way? Surprised that someone so smart as him could struggle so much with English after all these years. Lee kind of chuckles and then presents in perfect English that he was in fact born in California and can speak English just as well, if not better than any of us, but that people only really listen to him when he speaks in this exaggerated pidgin dialect. It's kind of funny and kind of sad at the same time. Apparently speaking perfect English is something that clashes with the world's view of him in light of his race, and understanding this, he just lets himself meet this expectation for the sake of making those around him comfortable, which affords him other benefits and allows him to blend in in other important ways. There's also a lot of focus on the experience of growing up poor as experienced by a child. The narrator for most of the story is not quite aware of just how poor her family is. She sees that she's often hungry, that her family can't afford anything, and that she has friends who are rich, making her somewhat conscious of her family's lower class status by comparison. However, she still has a perspective limited to what she's seen. Her her rich classmates are actually living quite modest lives by many American standards. She's also somewhat taken this poverty for granted, and although she sometimes wishes for more, and although we can see the way it affects her through hunger and through having to accompany her mother, for example, to work in a sweatshop and help with cutting those loose threads off of fabrics. She mostly accepts this as her lot and works within these constraints, just having a hard time imagining that the scenes of American families she's seen on TV are anything more than a mere fantasy world, and instead wondering why there are so many things out there to buy that no one could possibly afford. But other times, she's made more painfully aware of her place. In one interaction that leaves a lasting impact on the young Chin, a woman who's a friend of her parents is taking care of her while her mother's in the hospital and tells her quite bluntly, people say we're low income, but if my family is low income, then yours is no income. This leaves the fourth or fifth grade Chin hurt and confused since her family does make income, but she grasps the essential point that her family in a way belongs to a lower class than even this self-pronounced low income woman's family. Finally, there's the aspect of growing up undocumented, a source of constant fear for Chen and her family. On some occasions, it prevents them from seeing proper medical treatment, and in the young Chen's eyes, there's no clear distinction between law enforcement authorities like cops and medical authorities like the paramedics who will arrive in response to a 911 call, making an emergency call seem about as dangerous as calling the cops. The reader, though, shares throughout these accounts a secret knowledge, one that the adult narrator tells us very early on, which was that at the time, no one actually cared that there were undocumented residents living in New York, and her family was 
actually in very little danger of being deported. But of course, this was no solace to the young narrator's family, who simply has to assume the worst, which is that they are constantly being sought after as illegal residents of the U.S. And we can see the effects this has on our narrator in the fear and anxiety it provokes. Although this connection with the fear of deportation is only occasionally made explicit, we see in one part of the book how this fear, in combination with fears about health and getting enough to eat and the like, have driven Qian to a state where, for reasons she can't fully grasp, she finds herself constantly nauseous and frequently vomiting in public. Now, from what I've said so far, which is pretty intense, you might think that this story is one big sob story, but it's really not. Ultimately, it's a story of finding joy and hardship, such as one dazzling scene where Qian's mother takes her to wherever the place is in New York City that you go to see the lights and Christmas or holiday displays. A scene that proved to Chen that in spite of its rougher edges, America really could be the beautiful country that she was conditioned to view it as. The story ends, I think, sometime during Chen's sixth grade year at school. I'm not going to tell you exactly what happens at the end. You can find that out for yourself when you read it, which you should. But it did feel to me like a fitting ending to this part of her life and to the story she told in the book. There are actually sort of two endings to the book, though, in a way that worked quite well for me. Uh, there's the natural ending to the story, written in a way that sounds very much like an ending, and then there's the final short chapter in which the author kind of fast-forwards through time to connect this girl with the present version of herself. It's this sort of surreal presentation in which Chen, as she grows up, begins to distance herself from this girl of the past who was her and the struggles she went through at the time, all the while still kind of realizing without acknowledging it that these experiences still haunt her. And of course, we only get to see glimpses of what this all means, yet Chen has laid the groundwork for this final chapter so well in the book through the telling of her story that I found it incredibly effective and really moving. I'll admit I teared up a few times in the last few paragraphs because it's quite beautiful in the way that the present Qian has framed the story. You see, along with the very first chapter of the book, this chapter really contextualizes why it is that the author has finally chosen right now to take on the writing of this memoir. Without saying it in as eloquent a way as the author does herself, I'll just say that she presents the telling of this narrative as finally offering an act of love towards this girl who was her childhood self, that, that this girl really needed, but that she refused to extend for a long time after this story ended. It's actually a really powerful idea that I think any of us can do, um, this act of visualizing uh, yourself comforting an, an earlier version, if you could interact with, with an earlier, younger version of yourself who was really suffering at the time and felt really lost, to be able to imagine reassuring yourself at the time. At least I think it's very powerful. And so I really enjoyed this memoir. Uh, it reminded me in some ways of Wild Swans by Jung Chang, another book I enjoyed in 2022 about three generations of a family growing up in China. Not so much because it was about a Chinese girl, although that's a surface level commonality, but more because both are memoirs with a heavy emphasis on the character's childhood. And they're told in the form of short little sequential stories about events both minor and major, but all highly memorable in the eyes of the writer. And both of them frankly involve this theme of finding joy while experiencing great struggle. There are awful things that happen in both of these books, but neither of them is at all what I describe as a particularly dark or depressing memoir. However, while Wild Swans is a thick, multi-generational story spanning almost a hundred years of life in China and through many momentous historical events, Beautiful Country spans just around five or six years in the life of one child and thus feels a lot more compact. Wild Swans takes us on a long journey, while Beautiful Country is a deep reflection on a few of the author's formative childhood years. Wild Swans ends with a journey from China to America, while in Beautiful Country, the United States is precisely where the story begins. And Wild Swans carries a certain sense of distant remembrance for the events within. I describe them in my review of that book as like the stories your grandmother might tell you when you're visiting her as a child. Whereas in Beautiful Country, you can really feel these events reverberating loudly in the author's present experience. If I had to recommend one for a general reader, I pick Beautiful Country for a few reasons, most of them amounting just to the fact that it feels more easily accessible, particularly for someone who lives in the United States today, and I think there are ways that it could resonate with just about anyone. But I think the books would also complement each other well, particularly if you're interested in hearing stories written by Chinese or Chinese-American authors. So that's Beautiful Country, one of my favorite books of 2022. Thanks for listening, and happy reading.